I did not dress like this for you folks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we had a visit with the state auditor's office, and regardless of what your audit looks like, it's always a good idea to dress. Yeah. So I came from there to here, and this is what I look like. Um, when I got asked to talk about living snow fence, the first question I asked Ryan was, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, whatever you want. So guess what? I'm going to talk about whatever I want to. Um, I haven't done a living snow fence in a long time. Um, actually, I've never planted a living snow fence. I paid for a lot, but this information that I'm going to share with you, it comes from about 96, 97, 98. And so I'm going to share with you what that living snow fence initiative looked like um, and some of the things we did well. And I'm going to be brutally honest with you, some of the things we didn't do so very well. And because there's some veterans in here, and thank you for that, um, I'm also going to ask your experiences too. Because sitting in a chair writing checks is very different from you guys being on the ground planting the trees. And you live in your counties, you know some of these plantings, you know what, what happened. What happened. <coughs> also, again, um, I'll be honest with you all the way through. Yeah. If you have any questions or you have any experiences, something you want to share, please do that. We're probably not going to go the whole 45 minutes, so anything related to forestry, trees, nursery stock, anything you guys want to talk about from the North Dakota Forest Service perspective, you're welcome to bring that up. You can grab me on the side, you can talk about it in the group, whatever you're comfortable with, but I will be honest with you. I will tell you um, what I know. And if I don't know it, I'm going to look at some of our staff there and they're going to help me out too. So Josh and Cody, you're on, on notice. All right. So Living Snow Fence Initiative, um, again, in 19, oh, one last thing I want to say. We, we, a bunch of us started tree promotion back in about 98, 99, something like that. Yeah, God, that's a long time ago. How many of you weren't alive in 98? Oh, just barely. <laughs> okay, just barely alive. Okay. Just barely, man, barely alive. Um, and it has grown and, and gotten better. And at first it was North Dakota Forest Services, myself and Roy, and then as the NDCBA started to grow and their leadership developed, um, you guys took on a larger role. And I wanna thank you because you're doing a spectacular job. The agenda is, is unbelievable. You've got good speakers, um, with the exception possibly of one. And um, I, I'm really proud of you because you're talking about more than just tree promotion. You're talking about things that are important to soil conservation <coughs> districts are bringing partners in. So thank you. It's not everything that lasts 20, <coughs> and I'm not gonna do the math, I was told there would be no math. Over 20 years, um, you guys have been doing this and, and I appreciate that. So, 1996, 1997, anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah, not a great winter, <laughs> you know, um, statewide. Unlike this winter where southwestern North Dakota is pretty open still, it has been open all winter. Uh, northeast, east, northern North Dakota looks a lot different than southwest North Dakota. So in the winter of 1996, 1997, uh, we had a catastrophic winter. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the stats, but uh, we actually, we being a, a group of people that were interested in the possibility of using living snow fences across the state, had to really start to talk with people that we weren't accustomed to working with and that was people like Department of Emergency Services, FEMA, DOT, about what a living snow fence is. Because the knee-jerk reaction after that winter was, we're going to look like Wyoming and we're gonna put up slatted fences all over the state of North Dakota. And North Dakota has a rich history of conservation tree planting. It made sense to us that we would use a conservation practice to fix some of these problems. So we started right at the, at the foundation what's a living snow fence? And all of you know that, so we're not gonna spend any time. We had to talk about what living snow fences do and why we want or why we think this is a better solution than uh, a built or a man-made fence. And um, these were some of the statistics that we came up with. And the reason I'm talking about this is because eventually we put together, we. Uh, put together a proposal for FEMA hazard mitigation funding for over a million dollars and the, the packet 
that went to FEMA was 64 pages long. And they wanted to know cost-benefit ratios, they wanted to know the impacts, they wanted to know the delivery system, they wanted to know all this stuff. So this is why this information exists. And uh, you're probably gonna laugh because the bottom one may or may not be true. They need a little care or maintenance. Bob's <laughs> nodding his head. This was a sale pitch relative to, so in my defense, relative to a man-made fence, they need less care and maintenance. But we know that you can't just walk away from, from a conservation tree planting and expect them to be out there. Even if you design it well, you meet the NRCS specs, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show some, some things out there that exist, my fault. Um, you can't just walk away from that stuff, so. We talked about all these things, snow removal costs, again, 1996, 97, there were uh, 11 storms, and what we found out was the first, second, third storm, probably not a problem. Uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, you're starting to have problems with your highways, and then, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th storm, as that comes through, you've got real problems on roadways, and it's very easy to tell where you're gonna have a problem. Any place where the road is above, excuse me, the, the ground, the adjacent ground is above the road, probably gonna run into some problems, so I'm gonna show you a couple of those. Um, we talked about the amount that was spent by counties to, to remove snow. And what we, at the time, in 96, 97, the stats were it takes about $3 a ton to move snow, it takes about three cents a ton to store snow, you live in snow fences. Uh, and then we did have some tragic loss, loss of lives too, and that was people couldn't get to where they needed to go. Um, they, they had accidents in their own uh, problem areas, and, and that was catastrophic. That's really the piece that got FEMA interested in the possibility of living snow fences. And again, this was something that was new to FEMA. They never paid for one, so we had to start at the bottom. So a little bit of background. We really talked about landowners interested in, in uh, well, the whole initiative would hinge on somebody taking a piece of ground out of production or out of use and making that available to keep a road clear. And you can imagine, and it's no surprise, and you probably experienced this yourself, if a landowner traveled that road and experienced the problems themselves, they were way more interested in having a living snow fence. So county, township roads, a fair amount of interest, especially if the person traveled. State highways, mm, interstates, don't even talk to them about it. They didn't want to be out there because they didn't see the impacts to themselves as much as they <coughs> um, The second piece is we talked a lot about, and I sold this one really heavy, that we were only gonna plant living snow fences on documented sites. And there were a ton of documented sites. We talked to mail, mail delivery people, we talked to snow plow operators, we talked to school bus drivers. So the, the maps existed, there was tons. But you folks do like we do, we pick the low hanging fruit. You pick the landowner that wants to work with you, that has a site. Those are the places you go to first. So that didn't work out quite so well. We worked with the people that walked through the door um, based on the incentives package that was available to us at the time. But having said that, we did have sites identified. There's a lot of sites we didn't get to. There's actually more sites that we didn't do, far more sites that we didn't do than sites we did. So this is kind of, I put this in to poke fun of myself. I am the only one you can't see in that photo. I'm uh, hiding behind somebody. Yeah, and everybody else except for Senator Hoban is gone. They've all retired. They've, I think a couple of them have passed away. Uh, but <coughs> the, the group that, that uh, formed the Living Snow Fence Task Force, and I'll show you that group, really did believe that they needed to use existing delivery systems and supplemental funds. Um, this group got some notoriety, but the reality is the Soil Conservation Districts did 99% of the work. Um, you can see clothing styles have changed a little bit in a few years. So through the course of 98 to 2005, 2006 ish, we had a kickoff. We did a living snow fence project in Cass County, right in the town city of Fargo. Uh, at Riviera Heights, that was the Arbor Day celebration in 98. 
that Livingstone fence still exists. Uh, Riviera, Riviera Port Trailer Park was snowed in, I don't know how many times. Emergency vehicles couldn't get in or out of that place. It was a, it was a logical place. Uh, at the time, the Centennial Trees Advisory Committee made, they thought this was cute, $33,333 available for living snow fences. So that was a pilot project. They made that much money available for living snow fences and then we started to ask for grants. So, uh, and I'll talk about the grants in just a minute. 90, uh, 40 counties, that's generally for some reason in our agency, we work with 40 counties. I don't know what happens to the rest of the soil <laughs> conservation districts. I don't know, but it's generally in, in most of our, and I think living snow fence, or excuse me, uh, windbreak renovation right now, we're in about 40 counties, so we need to make better friends with the rest of the counties that are going to participate, apparently. Uh, there were 595 projects, 594. I know that because I wrote every check, and I worked with each of the soil conservation districts, and I got to know you folks really well at the time. And I really enjoyed that. So because we didn't do single rows of trees, there was 951 miles of trees planted to protect 270 miles of roads. Uh, and then the total project cost for 3.6 million. Nowadays, $3.6 million doesn't seem like a lot of money. This was the largest grant that our agency could ever manage at the time. The FEMA hazard mitigation grant was about $1.1 million. So um, <coughs> there's a living snow fence task force. Most of those people still exist. We don't talk to them all anymore. Um, you know, we, we stood this up, we did the best we could for a while, and then as interest drained, and as we had a few good winters, um, you know, we just stopped doing it. Like last winter, you couldn't get a person to talk about living snow fences very easily. This winter, yeah, probably in certain places. Okay, so some things we did right, and we as all of us. We use long-term agreements in North Dakota, and again, if anybody has some, some thoughts on some of this stuff, because not all of this is completely right, but when we looked at Minnesota, they used easements. Has anybody ever tried to work an easement? That's not a fun process at all. It takes forever. So we used 10-year agreements, and I think that was a stroke of this. We know some of those, those plant things don't exist out there in the landscape. We understand that, but instead of trying to set an easement for every living snow fence, we use long-term agreements for everything. And I am going to smile because we said uh, we utilize standardized NRCS practice specs. I'm going to show you some, and uh, there's a few that you'll you'll call me out on. We said that for FEMA, we expected most people and most of the, the planting would. We also understood that some of them might not, uh, and that's probably not the end of the world. The local delivery system were soil conservation districts that we folks, and then we also were not. We didn't dictate a one size fits all. We said. Uh, up to five rows, soil conservation district, go out on the landscape, work with the landowner, make sure that it fits their needs, make sure that it fits the landscape, make sure it's going to fix the problem. And we did most of that. We have some failures there too. And then we created a, a package, uh, actually a couple different packages. And I'm not going to bore you too much with numbers. It's getting warm in here, isn't it? I turn the heat up and it's getting warm in here. Um, the first one was on state and interstate highways. We used FEMA hazard mitigation funding, and that paid for all the trees. Trees up to five rows, fabric leaf barrier. And then we used additional funding from North Dakota Department of Transportation to pay for a land rental. So it was 10 years of land rental, one time lump sum all up front. As soon as you plant up the trees, you got 10 years worth of land rental based on average soil rental rates. On the county and township side, we used uh, CRP, DRP, what was the continuous sign up? I almost forgot the name of the program. And then we added in some DOT funding for that. And that allowed 100% of the trees in the fabric weed barrier and a, a land rental through CRP. So that, those equitable packages worked uh, pretty much anywhere in the state of North Dakota. Uh, again, we allowed for a variety of, of designs. Um, we really didn't want Again, a one size fits all. There were some people that wanted three rows, some people wanted five rows, some people wanted two sets of twin row high density, some people wanted five rows across the field. And uh, that worked out fairly well. We did get the question, how far away can a living snow fence be planted? Because some people wanted to, to go as far away from the road as they possibly could. And there's some advantage to that because you've got that strip of land between the last row 
in the ditch, and a lot of people didn't know what to do with it. So we set an arbitrary, I don't even know how 600 feet came up. I think Craig Stang said, ah, 600 feet. So anybody have any experience other than that distance? Living snow fences being effective beyond 600 feet? That was a guess, so I'm, I'm asking you, are they effective beyond 600 feet? Do they need to be closer, do they need to be farther? No experience? No experience, okay. And then you're gonna laugh because I haven't even talked about the application, but I thought we were doing great business because our reimbursement system was two to three weeks. Remember, this is 98, 90, you know, not everything was electronic. So if you sent me a bill, I could get you paid within two to three weeks. And, and to me, that was like rocket science. I was so proud of that, that was so cool. And the better part was, I didn't pay the landowners, I paid the soil conservation district. So you got paid directly for trees and fabric repairing. I, I just thought that was so cool. I thought it was so damn smart. Um, we also created a fairly straightforward system for signing up. And it was literally a one page form. It was an application form. And I thought that was pretty cool too because we dealt with ACP and a bunch of other FSA programs that weren't quite so easy to get through. Um, and we also asked for an FSA photo, you know, with a thing going on. The interesting part was I had a landowner not understand what an FSA photo was. He actually contracted a pilot to fly him so he could take aerial photos and he sent it to me. And I was like, oh dude, those <laughs> are really nice, but you could have gone to FSA and paid two bucks and got a photo and just drawn it on it. But he was pretty proud. Um, so the, the application process was pretty easy. And then uh, really the, the problem we had seen with a number of programs that we had delivered over the course of many years was there would be funding for something like stewardship incentives program, SIP. You've probably never heard of it. Uh, it would be here for a couple of years and then it would disappear. And then Forest Land Enhance, Forest Land Enhance Program, FLEP. Um, that got, came in, you remember that one? That's a great acronym, best acronym ever, FLEP. Um, that got here for like three to four years and then it disappeared. So what we really wanted was a source of funding that would be around with a good pot of money that would be here for a number of years. And it was here for almost 10 years. So that, that was a good thing. And then we didn't draw boundaries. We didn't use watersheds. We didn't use uh, counties. We said the whole entire state of North Dakota could participate in this program. The only difference is the average soil rental rates varied from Cass County, obviously, to Sioux County or Irvine County. So that was a difference. And then we, many other states were looking at using ornamental trees for planting living snow fences, which are, can you imagine? They're really expensive and they're really hard to maintain. We talked long and hard about using conservation trees and NRCS specs, and I know I've said that over and over again, but that was a really key piece. It made it cost effective. It made it more and more usable. Okay, so here's one of my naughty pieces. Did anybody see the problem? Slope. The what? Slope. Slope is part of it, yeah. Is that the claim count? That is the claim found. North of Mercer. I fixed the fabric on that. When Did I you? How many rows of Colorado blue spruce are there in a row? <laughs> Five. <coughs> is that neat spec? No. Probably not. And the really amusing part is so that it, it's squared with the field, the field edge is straight. They dropped down to three rows right at the place that they needed the most protection. So <laughs> I drove by this last week. There's a pile of snow on that road because the, the wind comes across, it drops all that snow in the three rows. There's not enough depth in that living snow fence at the top of the hill to capture that snow. So we actually have created a bit of a problem there. And uh, you need to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> it was planted when I got there, right? It was, it probably was. That was a fairly early adopter. But these are the problem <coughs> place. Anytime the surrounding or adjacent landscape is higher than the road, you're gonna have a problem. You've seen that, you, you know exactly what this is one of our naughty sites. Um, probably should ignore it. I was just on that road and I guess I didn't pay attention. But I didn't think there was that much snow. There's not a ton of snow, but there is snow on the road, yeah. And the other thing that we found, Crick Stangy was probably the one that pointed this out to us. Um, there's actually an advantage to being out a little bit further because the snow gets trapped and then you get a little bit of wind speed back up and that blows the road clear and you've seen this too where trees are close you'll the road will be clear because it gets blown free 
and then where trees are protecting the road if they're too close, then you run into snow and ice, and then you run right back out of it. So there was a feel and a, and a thought that the further back you were, maybe the better that was. The problem again is, what do you do with that strip of land between the road ditch and that first row of trees? We, we, I'm not sure if I should tell you this, but we didn't. I, I'm going to, I told you I'd be honest. We actually <coughs> put that piece of ground in the FEMA contracts because we knew that that would impact the landowner. So if there was an acre strip of cropland in there, that was in part of the rental agreement. That was part of the acreage because we knew that that was, that they were being impacted. So there, I told you that. Hope I don't get in trouble for that. Oh, wait a minute. We use fabric weed barrier also on almost everything. Thought we were geniuses for that too. We thought we could plant things and we can walk away from fabric weed barrier. How many of you have seen problems with fabric weed barrier? Yeah, almost everybody these days. And these are old enough now, the ones that are planted in 98 through 2000. I guarantee you there's problems out there. Okay. Anything else? I mentioned this one before. Landowners identified the roads they travel. We got a lot of people that wanted to use Livingstone Fence funding for their driveways. Um, lots and lots and lots of that. We tried not to do that. Um, if it was protecting a road and happened to hook toward the driveway, maybe we'd do a little bit of that. But generally, uh, people wanted to protect roads they, they traveled. Um, again, poor road design causes problems. Uh, you'll see more and more. There's a lot more crowning uh, when they do no road construction on, on roads and when they resurface or they, they recrown roads. They try to bring, they being DOT, generally tries to bring the road surface up as high as they can. So we don't create problems. And again, we also learned that most living stone fences are good for a few storms. The fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, ninth, tenth, twelfth, that's when we really start to have problems. And that's a winter like this one. I am sorry that I had to draw this. You have no <laughs> idea how long this took me. Um, and it really was a, a eureka moment. It was something that we all saw during the winter of 96, 97. It was also something that DOT um, reminded us of, and that was that trees create problems sometimes, and trees planted too close. So the old spec was from the windward row, the outside row on the left, 165 feet to the center line of the road. That was the spec. That's too close in some places. That's too close in a lot of places. Uh, the new spec was, is, maybe, I am kept track, is it still? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, 200 feet from the windward row, the left row, to the nearest traveled portion of the lane, which is the, the shoulder of the road. Uh, that has been very helpful. That's the minimum. And we talked to game, or excuse me, to uh, DOT long and hard about, rather than removing trees that were causing problems, let's talk to the landowner about adding roads <coughs> windward and, and reducing the, that, that way because we weren't sure what was gonna happen if we start, started removing trees. And then as you all know, venturi effect gaps cause problems. What happens when you have a gap in your tree road? The wind speed increases, you get a blowout. Yep, that's exactly right. We knew that. And that's the reason why our, I think I got a slide here. Coming up, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, we also found out that as we got toward the end of the grant, we had this really great idea that we would start to plant living snow fences on, on right of ways on the interstate system. And we found out pretty quickly that there's not a lot of room, there's not enough room. Uh, in most places for that. We did some in, I think in Burley County. I know we did some in Kidder uh, in Richland County as well, but there's not enough room on those, uh, on those runways to, to uh, fix problems on the interstate. Uh, we did twin row high density shrubs. I don't know if anything is out there still, and I doubt they're solving problems. We know that underpasses is a huge, huge area for problems, and that's what that tried to do. It didn't, it wasn't successful. I'm being honest with you. And then to a point, more rows are better, or to a degree. We, I got in trouble with FSA because we set up the five rows for, for uh, continuous CRP, and they wanted to go three, and we, we wound up going five. And generally, five is better than three, if, if you have the room for it, if the landowner is interested in it. 
And then you folks all know, and I know that diversity is important. Um, we have certain species out there, if you have a three row belt or two row belt, you lose a row, you got problems. So uh, as much diversity as humanly possible is, is always a good thing. And uh, we also know that every soil conservation district doesn't plant living stuff fences the same way. Every district tech doesn't plant living stuff fences the same way. So not every living stuff fence is the same. And then we also found out really quickly as soon as landowners changed, the new landowners didn't necessarily like what was going on in their land. We lost a fair amount of tree plantings pretty quick as soon as the land changed hands. There was one in Botno County just down the road from where I lived at the time that, that uh, they got the tree spade out and uh, moved the trees right away. The new landowner made a bunch of money on, on the spruce. They looked spectacular, but there was not a lot I could do. And then we are way ahead of schedule which is a good thing. Uh, I'm gonna make fun of myself there. Uh, I was wearing pleated pants. Uh, you can see me behind. I'm winking at Craig Stangy for some reason. I have no <laughs> idea why I'm winking at Craig Stangy. And then pleats were in, because the gentleman on the right also has plant, uh, pleats as well. This was a living snow fence project at Bismarck Airport, and it was unique. We had some, some projects that, that were different. This one was, inside the fence at the airport. It was actually designed to protect the people going to the community of Lincoln. They did not want tree or shrub species that were tall because of the airplanes, obviously. They also didn't want trees and shrubs that attracted wildlife because of the airport, because of the airplanes. They did not want to suck birds through turbines too desperately. So we wound up planting lilac and tarragon, I think, out there on that site. And I couldn't tell you if that one still exists. I think it does, do you know? Yeah, okay. there's a bunch out there. Okay, I think that one still exists. So questions about living snow, again, disclaimers, we're not, as far as I know, our agency isn't setting up a living snow fence program right now. Um, there's no initiative at this point. I'll probably get asked during the legislative session this next year what, what we're doing on living snow fences. But uh, yeah, go ahead. So I'm, New to this, I'm only three months. Me too. Here, so, <laughs> how in McLean County we usually have, have big farmers. Yep. How do you approach a landowner to convince them of possibly doing this when they're more apt to be tearing out tree rows to have more crop? It's funny, and and you folks probably have a better uh, understanding of how that works. And I, this is a long way to answer your question, but in 96, 97, we looked at all the reasons why people are planting trees, and we made a list, and that was soil conservation district, district people that were sitting in your seats at the time. And that was a great list. And then we made a list of all the reasons people were pulling out trees, and it was young people are pulling out trees, and then the old people don't like trees, they're pulling out trees. And then the Germans are pulling out trees because they don't like trees, and it was bigger farm equipment you know, we're losing trees because of farm equipment. And there was this huge list, and it was basically everybody's pulling out trees. Nobody likes trees anymore. Um, I found a list that was created in the 1950s. It was the exact same list. Mm -hmm. And the, they're talking about farm machinery, probably 12-foot drills at the time. That was the big <laughs> equipment in the 50s. That, so I don't have an answer for you on that one. What, we, what I think happens generally is somebody is motivated enough, hears about the program, or you folks talk to somebody, and they'll be an early adopter. And the money won't be so bad that they feel like they're losing a ton, and then the neighbors start to watch. And, and that's generally how things go in counties. So you gotta be an early adopter or early adopters, uh, somebody who's got some initiative, and then other people, it kind of takes hold. But, I don't know what the sales pitch is. Bob, you've done a ton of these. Betty, you did a bunch of them. Um, was there a was there a strategy you used, or did you just find somebody that was you knew would be willing? Well, back after the storms in '96 and '97, my technician Emery yep. took a county map and went to the highway department and the county commissioners and stuff. And they all marked out where all these troubled spots were. Yep, everybody knew where they were. We went around with this map, and okay, we went to 
Farmer Joe who said, you know, this year's been a problem for you know many, many years for the highway department or for the township or whatever. And some of them we were able to convince, you know, to give them a try. Yep. Other ones, you know, no, I'm not giving up my farmland. Yep. But now their <coughs> children or grandchildren or whatever, now they're coming in and saying, no, nope, this is a bad spot. Every winter, you know, we get our road blocked and you know, we're always calling the township to come and Fix call it. the road or whatever, you know. And we're starting to get some to come back now because they're seeing it. And yeah, now we're looking at making sure there's at least a 60 foot strip so that they yep. can make one loop around the, the trees. To go all the way around, yep. yeah. And what are you using for incentives for them? What incentives package? Because we Not found much. that people wanted to get paid. Um, they wanted to get paid. So. Starting, yeah. on, starting on a smaller scale sometimes and getting them started on trees. Because the living snow fence gets to be a big project, but if you start with a small project, yeah. a lot of times, a lot of time, plan lot of times after two <laughs> years, they come, they come back in and they, they get used to what, you know, they get the knowledge of trees a little bit and yep. then they get more comfortable with it. It's kind of kind of leads into it. I mean, I've had a lot of that way where you started small and then it grew into a 10,000 foot planting. And yeah, so. you start with just two rows and they said, no, oh, they did this year, so if I would have put five in, yeah. I would have had, yeah. yeah. You so get them okay, trade friendly. Yep, yep. So. good plans. One thing I did not mention is oftentimes, like, this isn't the greatest example, but the problem is like, everybody knows what it is. But nobody wants 300 feet of trees. They want it a quarter mile or they want it a half mile. So we were willing to do the whole stretch for uniformity's sake and so that they could, it could build into the farming practice. And we were willing to pay for that for the 300 foot site. We wanted the 300 foot site, we we're willing to do a quarter mile. Sure. So this has uh, recently come up in Walsh County where our highway superintendent met with the county commissioners and kind of that, you know, same thing you're talking about there, Betty, where there's just so many bad areas um, we've had two fatalities, one was just a few weeks ago, and the other was um, a woman driving from Grafton to Minto that was disorientated and yep. ended up in the middle of the snow field. Going at an angle and, yep. Her car somehow started on fire, she burnt up in the middle of a field, um, wow. and then law enforcement and everybody had to go out there and try to retrieve her. But, um, so it's definitely on people's minds, and so the comment the commissioners made was to the highway superintendent that he needs to work with the soil conservation district and we, so we talked about this I think it was our last meeting we talked about how do we do this you know that same thing like do we try to do a full-blown initiative or do we just do a pilot project because we're not sure that this has been done in our in our county so do we just need to set up a few sites like a couple on the west and a couple on the east and kind of just have that for people to consider or you know? I can tell you where all the Walsh County sites are. I'll send you. Can you? Yep. Okay. Yep. That'd be great. It, it'd be interesting to see how they're doing. Yep. I'll send you the. Okay. okay. Any, actually, any county that wants the information, email me and I'll send you what I have. I think I have all that electronically. It's in uh, WordPerfect. Remember that software? <laughs> yeah. So hopefully I can get it to convert to something that's useful to you. I think it'll convert the word, but yeah. God, I love the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of, I drive from Washburn to Turtle Lake. Yep. 200A from north of Washburn. Piles in, even if it's just, we have a couple feet of snow. Yep. There's piles in there, and then from that 200 corner all the way to Turtle Lake, there's a two mile stretch where it just drifts across the highway and Few times this this year going home, we have those big winds, just ground drifting and way out. I drive that same stretch occasionally on the way back back and forth. I go up one way to Botno and back that way, and, and it changes year to year. If you've got corn ground, you know it doesn't blow as bad. Bean ground, that's not great. There's not not a lot to hold that stuff in place, and even in a bad winter, CRP, what's left of CRP or, or uh, the pastures kind of. That 200 a yep. they went on a bad winter they would just close it down because the highway department would just give up they on it 
Yeah. Good Good yeah. Uh, that was just probably early 2000s. I know it was closed a few winters in a row. They just it build up and build up and build up, and every windstorm they pile in. Eventually, they just close the whole highway until it yeah. melted. And, and don't get me wrong. Um, when I said we're not standing up an initiative, it's because we haven't had the momentum, haven't had the groundswell. Um, again, I'll probably get asked during the legislative session. What people don't understand is it takes a lot of time and energy to get something with enough money to last for five, 10, 15 years, um, to get people interested, to get people going, to get everybody trained on the incentives and all that. Um, it's not that we're disinterested at all. Don't, don't mistake me there. Um, it just, and unfortunately, you know how this gets. Things have got to get really bad sometimes before people take an interest, or something catastrophic is the impetus for something better to happen later on. And I don't know why we function like that as human beings. It's really kind of sad. But we would not have done the Living Stuff Fence Initiative starting in 98 if we hadn't had the winter. And, and that's really sad. That's unfortunate. Any other experiences? Okay. I'll just tag on what Betty had said about um, the the map of the county was the problem areas. That's that's what we did. And then the one of the biggest sellers was that upfront land yeah. rental payment. Yeah. Because if a if a landowner would be able to put in the trees, get it all paid for, and then maybe three to five thousand dollars on top of that. That was that was a good selling point. So it was lump sum up front, and then five dollars an acre for maintenance for each of the ten years too. So it was it was a. I mean, you felt that when you got the check. It didn't make anybody rich, but I think they appreciated it. So right now there is no grant for doing maintenance. Not this type, but you could certainly do a living snow fence through the. The okay. statewide conservation tree planting grant that the NBCA runs, absolutely. Yeah. Equip. 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 Equip is another one. Yeah. Continuous CRP sign up was awesome. You know, that gave a land rental and gave a, a pip and a sip. I don't even know what those signing signing incentives program and a practice incentives program. And you can build yourself over 100%. God, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes. Any other questions about trees, about forestry, about tree promotion, uh, history, any of that stuff? While I'm standing here, we got about five minutes. Otherwise, you get back a few minutes of time before you go to the next session. Yes, sir. Kind of more for Betty, I guess. Betty. Uh, so if you start out with two rows on a snow fence, we're hoping to get more. Do you go with like a juniper and a, a shrub then? Or? Um. We, we make sure one is a shrub and then we try to go with a, you know either an evergreen or a taller tree um, right. most of them want to want a row of evergreen yeah. so but i always we always try to convince them to do at least one row of shrubs because they fill in a lot nicer and slow down that ground drifting for them and then did you go with the wider spacing between rows mm. No, not really. I, I want to say most of them are probably 14, 16 feet okay. between the rows. Okay. Good, just for the fact they didn't want to give up a whole lot of acres. Right. So we were going as close as we could to try and do some impact to convince them that this was a good idea. And then, you know, and a lot of them would say, okay, well, let's do the other three, but do them, you know, 16 feet if the other two were 14 because it was catching so much snow they wanted to catch more, so they spread them out a little further. Okay. So you, you started on the windward side or closer to the road? Or out in the field or closer to the road? And built out, out in the field. Out in the field and built that. Yeah. Okay. Because right. we always said, okay, how big is your equipment? Because they all said they wanted that one strip yeah, where they could right. go around. Gotcha. And so that's a little easier design that way as opposed to the other way. That would be tricky to design the other direction. Because you're going to start at 200 feet from the highway. Yeah. And then work your way to the Betty's done this. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Otherwise, I think we're good to go. I'll be, I'll be kicking around a little bit if you're squeamish about asking questions in the group. I'll be kicking around. Again, we've got a couple other staff, Cody and Josh, are here. 
And I think I'll be here tomorrow for the district employees meeting too. So we're good to go. Thanks you.